Okay, so I found out um, like 15 minutes ago that there's this actually a talk at 1 o'clock in 6501. Um, so I'm going to cut the lecture short today to an hour so that people can go to that talk. Um, so that means I'm going to actually just do this. Okay. So uh, hopefully we can get we can get to the monadic part, hopefully, by then. Um, so uh, let me ask if there's questions on the homework assignments, what people are working on, and so on. Let's see, what is everybody doing? I'm kind of cur curious. So what are you doing? You're doing the SSOS, right? Yes. OK. And Okay. Arba, what are you doing? Oh, okay, cool. Ellie, have you decided what you're doing? What was this? Oh, the rule permutations. Uh huh. Ian? So I'm working on the bi directional type tracking. Okay. Okay. So, what are you two guys doing? Okay, makes sense. Yeah, right. You get a project proposal in? You're getting your project proposal in? or? Uh, I'm still working on the last two, two exactly. Okay. If we do it up in Alibot or CLF, do, we, do you also want it like, you know, typeset and written up? or? Yeah, no, don't just send me a, like, a CLF source file. This is my assignment. No. Okay. <laughs> no, I want something written up, readable. Oh, permutations, okay. Oh, you're also doing the permutations? Hmm? How about the file with some comments? With some comments? I would prefer, I would prefer not. So now I need to figure out a way to extract uh, LaTeX from an Alibot file. No, you don't have to do that. You can, wait, an Alibot file. Oh. Okay. I wound up using Unicode anyways. Oh. Oh. So then begin, begin and verbatim doesn't work, right, with Unicode? Well, I could. No, I mean, you can quote the code verbatim in your whatever, in your, in your PDF or wherever it is. I don't care about the typesetting. It's just that there should be some text explaining what you're doing because I don't want to have to try to reconstruct, you know, what the code actually does. So, so you know, the... I think the best thing is just begin verbatim, end verbatim. If it, but I'm not sure about Unicode, though, so. Well, I can fix that. Yeah, OK. We'll, we'll talk. OK. Well, it wound up being when your Emacs mode made it really easy to put in the nav. So, <laughs> uh, so there aren't that many navs anyway. <sighs> OK. Exists. So, Matt, what are you doing? I don't know yet. Yeah, you don't know yet? OK. Yeah, we're meeting me today. OK. Uh, remember, it's due Monday. Christina, what are you doing for the, the Oh, the Confluence. Excellent. I'm glad somebody's doing that. Oh. Yeah. OK, okay good. OK, like I said at the beginning, before some of you came in, um, today I was going to talk about monadic concurrent logic programming, but that will not be possible because I actually have to stop at 1 o'clock because Umut Akar is giving a talk in 65. Uh, so that's um, GHC. 6501, and I had it in my calendar for the next week, so I forgot. I didn't even realize that he was talking this week. I just found out. Um, otherwise, I would have told you about this. So um, if anybody is interested in this talk, it's about programming languages, techniques applied to your parallel programming. Um, so it's, uh, it should be an interesting talk, but it's at 1 o'clock. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compress today's lecture. I'm going to cut off part of today's lecture and try to get it in in, in one hour today. Okay. So last time we talked about um, the monad. Okay, so uh, let me remind you of it, and then we'll try to focus it and see what the logic program interpretation of it is. Okay. So <coughs> I'm just going to concentrate on the linear part. Okay. So the idea was to have a, a modality, which is in some ways dual to the bang, but not quite. Okay. Um, so for reasons 
Um, so there's actually different notations. So another notation you might see is um, uh, circle A. Okay. Um, so that's uh, in brackets A. And sometimes in programming languages, people will write T of A. I guess it some, comes from category theory somewhere, right? Christina, is that correct? That kind of notation for monads? Okay, there's this notation T of A that you see often used for monads. Yes, that's because they usually Yeah, so that's some kind of from category theory. This, is, this comes from modal logic, and um, this comes from our implementation. Okay. Um, <laughs> because circle is not an ASCII character, and I'm not as crazy as Rob to go to Unicode with everything. Okay. <laughs> um, so since bracket and parentheses are already used, right, so there's a, a natural thing to try to do that. Okay, so anyway, so how do we actually do this? So the idea is that it should be weaker than truth. And the reason for that is that when we're doing, um, um, we don't want to allow forward chaining when we have an atomic goal. That was our main, main objective in trying to do that. There's another objective which I can't really tell you about because we haven't talked about logical frameworks, but in translation, we want our language to have a very strong, strong notion of canonical form, and that seems to require that we introduce this monad. So I might be able to, to tell you, not at, maybe at the end of this lecture, but maybe uh, at another lecture what I mean about this. But okay, so um, the way we do that is we introduce a new judgment, ALAX, and ALAX is going to occur only on the right hand side. So the validity judgment that we had to, to explain bang only appeared on the left-hand side and not explicitly on the right-hand side. A lax is dual to that. It only appears on the right-hand side and never explicitly on the left-hand side. Okay. Um, and uh, I'll get to a little bit about why that is actually the case in a little while. Okay, so we had that right rule. So that's the uh, um, monad right rule. Um, and then we had a... Uh, uh, monad left rule, which looked like this, if we have um, the assumption, uh, and we're trying to prove C. Okay, so now the restriction here is that we must be in a context where we only try to prove that C is true in the lax sense. Okay, um, then we're allowed to assume that A is true. So the idea is that if I just write a proposition A, I mean A is true or A is a resource, so I don't write anything there. And if I write lax, I mean that it's a judgment about the proposition, which is weaker than the truth in this case, meaning that it's lax true. Okay. And then I had a way to say, well, one way to prove that A is true in the lax sense um, would be to prove that it's actually true. Okay, like that. And so that's... Uh, a rule that uh, is a judgmental transition from lax to truth. Okay. Um, okay, so the intuition that came behind the original development of this logic came from this idea that A is true under some constraints. So A is not true in general, but if some constraints are satisfied, it would be true. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, okay, and we have a new cut principle, which we actually wrote down last time. If I have uh, delta, and I have A lax, then it's okay to assume that A is true as long as I'm trying to prove that C is lax. And then I can put these things together to prove that C is lax. So this is a new version of cut um, that talks about lax truth. Okay, so let's do a couple of proofs just to get a sense for um, what's going on. Um, so for example, we should be able to prove that um, okay, A implies lacks A, okay, because it should be weaker than truth, so we should be able to prove that, okay. Um, by the way, the, the way the difference to the way monads are used in functional programming is that, um, that in this setting here, um, these, the implications are linear, otherwise it's really the same thing, okay. So the linearity is somehow a confounding factor here, but otherwise it's really the kind of monad that you already know if you've done some function programming. Okay, so to prove that, we assume A, and we try to prove that. Um, so how do we proceed from there? Yeah. 
Yeah, we have to do the right rule. And then, then we use the lax rule. And then we use the identity at that point. OK? Um, OK. Um, let's see, what else should we So we, assuming we have a cut-free system, um, and I'm not going to prove cut elimination, I'm just going to, I mean, I have proven it, I'm not going to prove it here. Um, but with the new rule of cut, it's fairly easy to do. Um, we should be able to show that um, it's not the case that um, a lax A um, proves A. So we should be able to show that this is not true in general. So how do we do that? Um, do we need the focus system for that? I think we can do it without the focus system as long as we have the cut free system. Okay. Right. So here it's, it's pretty easy. We're forced to do implication, right? Okay. And now which rule is applicable now? Okay. Now no rule is applicable. Right, nothing, because we can only apply the left rule if this is C-lax, but this is truth, so we can't. So at that point, if the cut-free system is complete, we're stuck. Okay. So we cannot prove that A-lax or monad A implies A. Okay, so that's good. Um, let's see, what is the characteristic uh, of monads in functional program? What are the characteristic properties? Uh, bind. bind. So what's the, what's the logical formulation of bind? Okay, so that's what's called usually bind. So we should be able to prove this, okay? Um, if it's really a monad in the sense, okay? So if we're trying to prove that, after two steps, I think we're at that. A, um, A, B, and we're trying to prove B, right? Um, sorry. Okay, what do we do at this point? Now we're trying to find a cut-free proof. Yeah. The right rule. Okay, so this would be B lax. And here we would have A and A L B. Okay. Implication left. Hmm? Okay, if you now do the left row, okay, then the sub goal would be from, from braces A, we would have to be able to prove A, right? That would be the one sub goal. And we already know that that's not possible, right? We can't do that. So we have to get rid of the brackets, like you said, okay? And that's okay because we're at B lax. So we're allowed to assume that A is true. Okay, and now, now we can use the left rule. And the one goal is from A, we prove A, and the other goal is from basis B, we can prove B lax. I think I already have that somewhere on the board, don't I? No, I don't, I guess. So how do we prove that? First we get rid of the braces, and then we prove B is true on the right-hand side, okay? So let's look at the identity expansion also, just for completeness. Um, because the identity expansion is important, because the next thing I want to do is probably what? Focus the system. In order to focus it, why do I do the identity expansion? Our series rule is invertible, right? And so we see the polarity of the connectors by looking at the identity expansion. Okay, so. Um, 
Um, so no. What's the origin of no, no, no. This is just a crutch. You still have to prove it. It's a heuristic. Okay. Yeah. So I don't even know how to formulate it because it would be a theorem over all possible connectives and judgments, and I don't know how to prove such a thing. I mean, in a situation where only one of those, if only the right rule is invertible, then if you're going to be able to polarize the system, it's going to be negative. And the same is true the other way around. The issue is a lot of times you can do the identity proof either way. Or in, in some cases, you can do the identity proof either way, so it doesn't help you. Conjunction. Yeah, but it's not obvious to me that if in the identity proof you start with the right rule, then the right rule is always invertible. I'm not 100% sure how you would cast that as a theorem. It's always the observation, mm -hmm. but in order to cast it as a theorem, you would have to circumscribe and say, these are my space of possible logics I consider, mm -hmm. and I don't know how to do that. And you know, I try to do that sometimes, and some people do do that, but then the first example you have like, is outside the class, and then, you know, like, okay, then the theorem doesn't apply. So I have stop, stopped looking for those kind of theorems that apply for all logics, right? It's, um, okay. So, but as a guy, it's, it's always important to do identity um, because we, A, we want to know, and B, because it helps us down the line. Okay, so if we try, how do we expand this identity proof? Okay. Um, do we start on the left or on the right? I guess we have to study on the right. If we start on the left, then we get stuck um, no, we can't start on the left, anyway. Um, okay, so actually our hand is pretty much forced here, as far as I can see. And so up there is the identity at A, and we start it down as the identity at bracket A. So something that makes you suspicious here in terms of the polarity, the same thing happened with bang. There's this extra step that's going on here. Okay, so this is the bracket left rule, um, bracket right rule. This is the bracket left rule. But then we also has, have this judgmental rule or structural rule that happens without any connective. We had the same thing in bang. What was the structural rule we needed to prove identity for bang A? Copy, right? And so that usually means that there's something funny going on with the polarities, okay? So for Bang, what was the funny thing with, the, with respect to polarities and focusing? Uh, no, the right rule was not invertible. Yeah, that, that really doesn't interest us that much. No. The funny thing was that when you were focused on, you know, bang was positive, you were focused on the right, after the first step you had to lose focus. If you, if you pretended you could continue, you, there were counterexamples. I asked you to do that in the homework. And that was because of this uh, implicit uh, copy rule that was going on. And there, this is the analog happening on the right-hand side. So we would expect that polarity is going to be somewhat the normal rules of polarity are going to be somewhat disturbed when we come to looking at the focusing system for, for the laxity. Okay. Okay. So let's see what happens there. Um, okay. <coughs> uh. Uh. Okay, so um, from the proof over there, is it negative or positive? I just have to remember. Which rule isn't the invertible one? We start with the right rule, so it should be invertible on the right, and that means it's negative, right? The things that are invertible on the right are negative. So that means our rule should be something like this. If in delta for the focusing system, we try to prove A. Then we go to A max. OK? Um, all right. So if that is indeed negative, then what should be the left rule? 
So this is the focused red dwarf. So we're just applying the kind of things that we've learned, adapting to the new situation. So what should be the left rule? Um, so it shouldn't be quite the same. So first we have to say, well, C has to be lax, right? And if it's negative, when can we apply left rule? It has to be in focus, right? Okay, so we have to remember this can only be applied if this is in focus. And then, okay, we have A. Okay, so the next thing we have to ask, normally the focus of the subformula is, is inherited from the focus on the formula, right? So like if you do A tensor B in focus um, on the right, then the A and B components are in focus in the premises, except for bang. Because in bang there was this additional complication that we lost focus. Okay, so we have to wonder if this A should continue to be in focus here or maybe not. Okay, and so it might be good to look for a counterexample. Um, and if you can't find one, then we might conjecture it's okay to continue to be in focus. So the question is, can we continue to be in focus on A in the premise here? Okay. Can you see any such example? Can you see it, Rob? Okay. So how do we convert this example there? For these kind of things, always look at the identity proof, right? Okay. So can we take this example and convert it to a counterexample to maintain and focus on the left? Yeah, right. If A were in focus here, and that's, let's so say, a negative atom. We can't use a rule for negative atoms because the right-hand side would say lax. Okay. So that means that we wouldn't be able to prove C for a negative uh, brackets. Braces negative would imply braces P minus. We wouldn't be able to prove that because the first step we need is the right-hand side anyway. And then we have to unwrap this. This would be a P minus, but that would fail if that was still in focus because the right-hand side does not say P is true, and we would fail. So this would be your counterexample. Okay. So therefore, in this rule, indeed, we must lose the focus uh, when we go to the premise. Okay. So what happens is that the modalities, and this is a general observation for many logics, that modal operators um, often um, change the structure of your proof in the sense that you lose focus when you actually transcend if you descend through modal operators. So for bang you do, um, and for braces you do as well. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, so what else? What's next now? Well, I guess we should prove that this focusing is sound and complete. We don't really want to do that. Okay. Um, so I guess we should try to start looking at the logic programming interpretation of these things, okay, to see if it actually satisfies the kind of things we set out to do, okay. So the reason we have this is so we can try maybe combine forward and backward chaining. And principally, it was important to rule out um, forward chaining when we were trying to solve sub-goals. At least that's the way I motivated it, okay. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, so now we're going to try to put the, the, the formulas that we already had into a grammar, okay, and this grammar should be rich enough that we can describe in the same grammar both forward and backward chaining, and we're going to use the monad in order to separate out those two directions of reasoning, okay. So the way I'm going to do that is that we have, um, let's say, negative formulas, um, okay, so let me write A minus for these, and positive formulas. 
And in some sense, the way I'm going to think about this is that the negative formulas are the ones that are going to be responsible for backward chaining and the positive for forward chaining. Okay. So in the negative formulas, what do we have? Well, um, we have uh, negative atoms, and then we have a positive A proves a negative A. Why do I change polarity here? Why do I go from negative to positive? Right, because I'm starting out on the right-hand side, I'm moving over to the left-hand side. So this shows up on the other side of the turnstile, so I have to reverse right? the rule that's not invertible, that's invertible on the right, the positive ones are going to be ones invertible on the left. So this has to be here. Um, what else do I have here? Okay. The brackets is a negative formula. Um, okay. Uh, and what should be inside of there? Hmm? Right. So w the one way to interpret this, the fact that you lose focus here, is that brackets is negative on the outside and positive on the inside. Okay, so that's the way we often say it. It's negative on the outside because it's in focus. It's positive on the inside because you lose focus here. So that means what you have inside of here is a positive formula. So the brackets are kind of a polarity changing modal operator. Okay. Um, what else is negative? Which rules are invertible on the right? Tensor? No. One? No. Hmm? With? Lolly we have, right? With? And top. And these things are then again expected to be negative. Okay. So if you leave out the braces, this is what's called a negative fragment. Okay. Um, in which all the right rules are invertible, all the left rules are in focus, and you only have negative atoms, and so that gives you the backward chaining fragment. Okay. Now the positive ones, okay, they're like positive atoms. There are tensor, and we want these to be positive again, or they could be the unit, or it could be A1 plus A2, or it could be zero. We want this to be positive again. Um, or, okay, um, we have to be able to get back to this class of formulas here. So it could be some kind of negative A, or it could be a bang A. Um, and then if you had other modal operators that are like bang, like if we're in an ordered logic, there would be other modalities would be down here. And these things, again, okay. So what this is basically saying here, if you think about it, is that bang is a modality which is negative on the inside and positive on the outside. So Poe's talk, if you think about that, the reason you lose focus if you're on this on the right is that it's positive, so you're in focus. But when you come underneath, you, you find there are negative formulas sitting there, which means that you will lose focus and you'll now start inverting on the right. So bang is positive in the outside and negative in the inside, and the braces are negative on the outside and positive on the inside. Okay. So that's the way that these are related to each other. Um, and the fact that this is included here, you can think of this if you want, and there's a whole development going this, that there is a kind of an implicit coercion here, which has sort of a pseudo-modal character, I would say. It's almost like a modal operator. I mean, you can give rules for that. Um, but it doesn't change the logical meaning of this. It just coerces something from negative to being positive. Okay. So it turns out in the other direction here, we actually have something with important logical contents because it was important for application. In the other direction, we don't have that explicit coercion. Okay. Um, okay. So where do the quantifiers fit, just for completeness? The universal quantifier, is it negative or positive? Negative. negative. And so obviously, then the existential has to be positive. OK. Um, so eventually, when we get to CLF, which actually would be fairly soon, not quite in today's lecture, uh, we will generalize this kind of idea. Um, and um, you know, we talked about this, the Curry-Howard isomorphism, where um, um, 
proofs are programs and propositions are types. So this is a language of propositions here. Um, and here is a language of types. What you can do is you can close the loop, okay? And instead of writing tau here, you can put a type a in here, okay? So you can actually close the loop and you can use the types that you already, the propositions you have already as types, okay? Um, but if you want to have only the first order fragment, then you would have an A here. And there's a similar thing you can do. You can put a, a, an A here. Okay. So you're, you're identifying propositions and types instead of separating them out. Okay. There's an opportunity in that, but there's also a cost. Okay. The opportunity is that you can say more things. The cost is that you now have to reason about terms which have the types, which are proofs in this language. Okay. And then you have to be able to deal with unifying them, matching them, and so on, being able to write them down, and so on. So in some sense, I would say that's the difference between having a logic in which um, you don't actually can talk explicitly about proofs, and the type theory where you can explicitly talk about proofs because you have the propositions in your framework actually working as types of the bound variables. Okay. So for now, we'll ignore that issue because we still have to figure out how to use this for logic programming. Okay. Um, okay. So um, now we need to see um, some of the operational rules. Of doing that, okay. So the idea now um, is that if we have a clause that looks like this, Okay, so this would be minus and this would be plus. Um, that this does forward chaining. Okay. Um, okay. And if you have a clause that goes like this, that this corresponds to backward chaining. Okay, so these are, I should say, forward chaining clauses and backward chaining clauses. Okay, and from the point of view of judgment, it looks like this. If our judgment is to prove C lacks um, from some assumptions delta and possibly other things, okay, then because we're saying we're in, we're in the lax judgment here, what are we doing? Are we at that point forward chaining or backward chaining? We're forward chaining. Okay, so let's see what happens if we try to apply a backward chaining clause in forward chaining mode. So if you have a backward chaining clause and you're in the situation where the right hand side is C lax, would you be able to focus on one of these things? Yeah, so what would happen is if you focus on that, right, you solve the sub-goal here, or you, you, you stack up a sub-goal, if you will, and then P minus has to match the right-hand side, right? That's the initial rule, the identity rule for focusing on a negative atom requires that the conclusion is the same exact thing. Um, and that will fail because the conclusion list says C lacks. So when we're in forward chaining mode, we cannot backward chain. Okay? Is that clear? Okay. Um, People are not convinced. Okay, so let's, um, actually I should si assign some polarity here. Um, if we have lax on the right hand side, uh, will th what kind of um, polarity will that have? It should be positive, right? How can you see that? Well, that's what's exposed when you strip off the braces. So this will always be something positive. And here the A should be positive, right? And so this will be positive. Um, and what happens over here, that this would be positive, so A plus will be positive. Okay. So let's say um, we have a delta, and then we have focus on A minus or P minus, and we're trying to prove C plus lax. Okay. So just to write it out is that we have to split our context. Actually, we use context management, okay, so we actually do that in a lazy way, but let's avoid that complication here. Um, let's just write it like this. Um, and here we still have focus on P minus. 
and we have to prove C plus lax. And then if that succeeded, we'd have to solve for the subgoal A. So from delta 2, we'd have to solve A minus in focus like this. Um, oh, should that be A plus? Um, yeah, it should be A plus. OK. OK. Um, all right, so what happens here now is that we know if for this to succeed, delta 1 would have to be empty in any case. But the only way you can succeed if you have a negative atom and focus on the left is for the right-hand side to be identical to that. And it cannot. So we will fail. So any attempt at backward chaining, while our conclusion is C-lax, will fail. OK? So we have a separation now, at least in that direction. Now the second thing we want to check, that any attempt at forward chaining should fail if our judgment looks like this. OK, so if we're trying to prove a negative atom, that's the way we do backward chaining. We try to find a clause that applies such that this minus applies to that, right? So then if this was p minus is true, then it would be able to match. And we would, would match our, um, our solve, be able to solve the sub goal. So what happens if you try to now focus on one of these things in order to attempt forward chaining? Um, yeah, I guess it should be A plus in the most general form. So A minus is only a special case of the pluses. So it, I should have written in a more general form. So if you're focused on that, while you're trying to prove P minus, uh, what will happen? Then you have like uh, brackets and focus. Right. So after one step, um, let's see, I have another piece of chalk here. OK. So what happens is that if, OK, let's write it again. If we have in, um, in focus, because we're trying to focus on that, A plus arrow B plus. And we're trying to prove p minus, where p minus says p is true. Um, then we have one sub goal will be to prove a plus. And the other sub goal will have b plus and focus while we're trying to prove p minus. So what happens at this point? We can't use the left rule, OK, because B lax is too weak to prove that P minus is true. So at that point, we fail, because no rule applies, OK? OK, so we have separated out forward and backward chaining by using this mechanism of judgments, OK? So um, these clauses apply only in forward chaining mode. We're just defined by the fact that we're trying to prove C lax. These clauses apply only in backward chaining mode when we're trying to prove um, p minus in backward chaining mode. Okay, so now we have succeeded, even though we haven't written any interesting programs, in combining forward and backward chaining. Okay. Um, one thing we should do probably here is, um, okay, uh, there's one more focusing rule we need to worry about, namely the transition from C lax to C true how we focus that, OK? OK, so if we have delta and we have C plus lax, OK, what should be the premise? Yeah, we focus on C plus. Okay. So in the focusing system, because we're when we're on the right, we always focus on something positive because it's not invertible. If it were negative, then we would just go and 
uh, invert the negative ones. Okay. So here we have a right focus on C plus. So what basically that says is that there is some decisions to be made. When you're in a situation where you can do forward chaining, you can either apply forward chaining rule, okay, and any forward chaining rule is okay. So it's much less goal-directed than the backward chaining, because in the backward chaining, if you have P here, then only the rules which have a head that match will be able to apply. When you're in forward chaining mode, anything that ends in the monad, you will be able to apply. There's no other restriction, because when you have gotten to the monad braces, you lose focus, and now you just invert. So it doesn't matter what's on the right-hand side. That was important on our forward chaining, that we can compute without looking at the right-hand side. Okay. But eventually, in this situation, we still have something to prove at the end. At some point, we have to decide that we should focus on the right-hand side, and now in the state C, if we can prove C+. Plus. Okay. Now, the operational decision in the operational semantics for language is based on this, which are two right now. Uh, the decision is that you only apply this, this rule here, to focus on the right when you have reached saturation and quiescence on the left. Okay. So remember what these two components are. Saturation means that if you apply a rule that gives you something unrestricted, the unrestricted things were already there. Quiescence means that no linear transition applies. Okay, so you cannot make any more transitions. So you forward chain in completely um, sort of oblivious fashion to the right-hand side until you're kind of done with that and nothing else can happen. When, you, when you're done with that, okay, then you try to see if you can prove the right-hand side. Okay. So now let's try to see if you can write some program. Uh, these are the wrong kinds of pants for that. Um, um, if we can, uh, have I destroyed this thing yet or do still have sound? Okay. These things are very robust, luckily. Um, okay. So I want to write a little program now. Um, and I think we can do that in, um, okay. Trying to decide, should I write it online? Um, okay, let me try to do it on the computer because then if we're lucky, we can run it. Um, uh, yeah, but then nobody can see it except you, yeah. Okay. Okay, why this thing is booting up. Um, so the algorithm I want to implement is for a problem. Oh, I should say something about here. So in CLF, which is the main language that supports this, um, we have made some decisions about which fragment of this we can actually handle. Okay. So um, it's almost the language that's up there, but for a reason which I've hinted on several times, we don't have top, okay? And for the same reason, we can't really have zero. Because it has the same properties that it eats up the whole context because it's additive, right? Zeros on the left can be proven no matter what the other assumptions are, okay? Um, instead, we have added um, um, affine assumptions. So we have one more modality here, affine of A, okay? Um, and we go rid of top and zero instead. And then the other thing that we did is that um, these, you have quantifiers here, and it quantifies over negative things, okay, like this. Um, and then finally, we get rid of plus. What uh, Negative, yeah. So it's like bang. It has a different, it has the same flavor. It has a slightly different structural property, yeah. Um, and... Okay, and, and we don't have plus, okay. And the reason for this has mainly to do with this notion of um, canonical form and a little bit with concurrency, which I don't have time to talk about today. Okay, so here's the algorithm I want to implement. 
Um, so the algorithm I want to implement is for a problem called bipartite matching. Okay. And so the question is, I think the same is whether you can color a graph with just two colors so that no two adjacent nodes have the same colors. Okay. So the idea is something like, I'm already drawing it in this way. Um, okay, so you have some connections here. Okay, and you're trying to see can I color this with two, two colors. So here is how the algorithm proceeds. We pick an arbitrary node to start with, and we color this with one of two colors. Let's call this A. Um, and now, whenever we have a color, we have a node of, uh, with color A, we take an adjacent node. And we know because it's not allowed to have the same color, we can color this safely with B. In fact, it must have color B, right? There's no other possibility. Um, now, this has B, and this node is adjacent to it. It doesn't have a color yet. We, we color this A. This is adjacent would be B. Then this would become A. This would become A. And this would become B. And then, at that point, this part is complete. And now we have to pick an arbitrary node and color this A, for example. And then this would be colored B, and this would be colored A. At this point, there's nothing left, and we haven't reached a contradiction, and therefore we know that the graph is bipartite. If you have a graph like this, what happens is you pick a node, you color this A, you say, OK, this must be B, uh, this must be B, and then you realize, oh, I have two adjacent nodes, and they both have color B, so here I have a contradiction. My graph is not bipartite. OK, so that's the algorithm we're trying to implement. OK. So I wish I had known I had to stop in an hour. I would have prepared something here. Um, hopefully, we can pull this off in the remaining time. Um, Okay, that's progress. Okay, so let's start with the file. Okay, so first thing we need to do is we need to declare nodes. Uh, let's call it vertex as a type. What else do we need to do? Edge. Hmm? Edge. Edge. OK. Um, OK. So now we have to think a little bit about how we're representing that particular algorithm. OK. So how do we want to do this? OK, good. Yeah, always do the obvious thing instead of thinking about the hard stuff. Color is a type. OK, A is a color and B is a color. OK, so far we We need to associate nodes with color. OK, um, so OK, OK, what do you want to call it? Color takes a, uh, a vertex and a color. And gives you a type, okay? Yeah. Can there be a function to do to infer the color? Otherwise, you will have to duplicate all the two Um, didn't quite catch that. Can you say it again? Oh, you might want a function to infer the color for you. Yeah, so that you don't have to 
Um, okay, I'm not sure if we'll need that. We'll see. Um, so somehow we want to we want to consume all the nodes, right? We want to um, we want to when we come to a node, we want to color it, and consume it says we have colored it. We don't need to worry about it anymore, right? So we should have a, a predicate node, and that we want that to be used linearly. So it takes a a vertex and gives us a type. Okay. So now we should be able to write some rules. Um, so what would be some plausible rules? Okay. Okay. You want to call it not colored or bare or okay. Hmm. Okay, I'll just call it node and say these are the things that we haven't visited yet. Okay? Okay, so how do we start? So if there's a node that has an edge to something that's colored. We have a node x and an edge from x to y. Okay, I better capitalize these things. Sorry, I, for I forgot. Okay. And oh, that's another thing I forgot. Okay. Okay. So we have a node and an x from x to y. The edges should be persistent, right? We don't want to keep maintaining that. And so, what do we want to be? The color of X should be, I don't know. We want the color of Y, right? Oh, the color of Y, okay. Let's say it's A. Then we want to consume the node of X and produce the color of X. Okay, and we. Yep, yeah, so we should have two rules. So color with B should be that, and color with A should be have a node X and an edge x, y, and the color of y is b, and then the color of x should be a, OK? The colors are persistent. Once we assign a color, we never change our mind, OK? OK. All right. Okay. So we should have a node fact for everything. And when we're done, there should be no nodes left. Um, so it's a complication we haven't dealt with yet is that um, how do we start this algorithm? And how do, we, how do we continue after we're done with one coloring, one connected component? So how do we start the algorithm? Well, the fact that this is part of today's lecture would suggest we have to combine forward and backward chaining in some way, right? Okay, so we should load the context. So let's start with that. So we have nil is a, a vertex list, and we have cons, which takes a vertex and a vertex list and gives us a vertex list. And then we have something like a, a, a function that loads the context, 
um, I'm not sure, uh, what should we call it? Um, not bipartite, um, which takes a vertex list. And so the rule for that should be if, um, if we're at nil, um, how do we load the context? OK, well, we're done, so let's come back to that. If we have a cons of an x and an l, OK, how do we actually load, how do we load the context in this case? So we have to create a linear fact, right? And what's it called? Node. It's called node. So it's a node of x. Arrow, load the context with L, right? Does it make sense? <coughs> OK. And once we have reached nil, what are we supposed to do? Then we're done with loading the context. And now we have to somehow start the forward chaining, right, in order to search for things. So how do we do that? Any ideas? Just say that. Yeah? OK, so we could just take a node x, OK? Um, but we can't do it that way. Um, it has to be a sub goal, right? OK, so we find a node x, um, color it. And how do we color it? OK. And then? So remember, we're in the, forward, in the backward chaining clause. In order to solve this goal, we solve the sub goal. So node of x will take a node, consume it. And now we have to put into the context that node x has type A. So we can't just here solve this as a sub goal. We have to assume it. So we actually have to go back and say, this implies whatever we want to do, right? So we're replacing node of x, which means it's not colored, with this thing, except that we know it's unrestricted because the coloring, we never change our mind. Okay? And now we have to, what is the sub goal we have to, what do we have to do there now? We have to start a forward chaining phase, right? We have colored one single node, right, and removed that node. Like when we initialized this and we picked a, we picked this node and we colored it. Now we need to forward chain and color this whole thing, right? So we need to do a forward chaining phase. So the next thing has to be braces. So that when we get here with something, okay, we start forward chaining. Does it make sense? So if we start, our overall goal is to take a list of vertices, okay? Uh, we're going to load the context with those vertices until the list is empty. Then we pick one of the nodes, um, we color it A, and then we have to start a forward chaining phase. Make sense? OK. So now this forward chaining phase is going to continue as long as it can forward chain. It means as long as um, we can apply one of these two rules. Right? So that as long as there is still some node that we haven't colored yet, such that it has a neighbor, um, that has been colored. Okay. When we run out of these things, then forward chaining will stop because the rules can't be applied. And then this, whatever is sitting in here, will be solved as a sub goal. Make sense? Okay. What do we put there as a goal? How do we start the next phase? What is the next phase of the algorithm? Right. And so here's. I'll do it like this. Uh, and I'm getting NBP and NPB mixed up, but I want to do it like this. OK. Um, OK. 
Okay? So it goes back, and now the only clause that applies is this one. It will pick a node, it'll color it A, and continue until, until it's quiescent. Then it'll go back and solve this one, which will pick a node and so on. Until we've picked all the nodes and then all the, and there's no more nodes, so this will fail. So how do we succeed? If we're all done? That. Okay. That can only succeed if there's nothing in the linear context, right? And that means we must have consumed all the nodes, right? Okay. Um, okay. And how do we fail? Okay. So how do we do that? Um, how about color X A and color Y A? Um, we need to know X is different from Y, right? Actually, we don't need to do that. What we need to know that there's an edge from X to Y. Like that. Okay, so now the problem is we'll succeed in either case, right? We'll succeed if, there's, if we're done with everything, or we succeed if we found a contradiction, okay? So, um, so the question is how do we communicate whether we succeed or fail, I guess, is one of the issues, right? Um, um, and I guess we can't really succeed here in some sense, right? Because there will be some linear assumptions left that haven't been consumed if you find a contradiction before we're all done. Okay. So in these kind of algorithms, this is often a choice that you have made, uh, that you have to make. Okay. So one choice we can make here in order to get this program to run, unfortunately we're out of time, would be to say, we're checking that it's not bipartite, so we actually want to succeed in this case. Okay. When we find a contradiction, and otherwise we just run into conclusion. Okay. Um, and then we do not succeed. Okay, so then we just take out that thing here, um, the last line. And we need to make sure that we can consume all the, the assumptions that remain. One way to do that is to assume all the nodes as being affine so that they're allowed to be left over at the end. Okay, so that would be one thing we could do. Okay, um, okay so that would be this. And then here we would say we would have to say this is an affine node. And so what we're looking at here is an affine node. This is an affine node. Okay. Um, so this is actually that should succeed um, if it's not affine. And we have an explicit evidence because we had to color two adjacent nodes with the same, uh, with the same color. Okay. Um, I haven't actually thought about whether I can turn this around. Um, and succeed exactly if this is true, and may not be. Um, not sure if that's possible. Okay, with this kind of algorithm. Okay, so. Um, okay, so the program is. Uh, let's see how many rules. It's these two rules and these three rules. So unless we made a mistake, it's still a pretty compact program to implement the thing over there, and we really need to use a combination and forward and backward chaining in order to get it to work. Okay. Um, so, unfortunately, for the correctness of it, you really need to know um, that you only solve the sub goal that this thing is quiescent. Okay, you can't stop in the middle. Okay, because then in the next mind you might pick the wrong node and color it A by mistake and get a contradiction. Okay, so it's only correct because this thing here will only only go to the sub goal once you have reached quiescent here. Okay. Um, so we really are taking advantage of the operational semantics to make, make this uh, combination of forward and cha backward chaining work out. Um, all right, I'm not going to attempt fate and try to compile this. Okay. Um, and anyway, I really, I'm already four minutes over time, and I just destroyed this thing, so it's a good time to finish the lecture. Um, so um, next time we'll talk a little bit more about this language.
Um, and in particular, I will talk about the, um, uh, the concurrent aspect of this language. Okay, so there's actually a lot of parallelism in forward chaining that you can use to exploit, to write parallel algorithms. So we'll do that next time.